Hard from over in the College of Education, uh, where I teach counseling and psychotherapy, and uh, have been here since 2008. Um, I'm very delighted to be able to uh, introduce our guest. I, I do want to ask before we get started, how many of you are members of the College Democrats? How many of you would like to be members of the College Democrats? Okay, I think they need at least three more to be completely combobulated, so if you will see Paul afterwards, even if you're not sure you can attend, he needs three more names to be able to get us over the 10 mark. We want to have a good representation of Democrats on our campus. When they approached me, I said, we have college Republicans, we have college Libertarians, and in Alabama, we don't have any college Democrats, so I was, I was delighted to see them wanting to get started. Same thing, how many of you are members of the, the Gay Straight Alliance, uh, GSA? Woo! Oh, yes. How many of you would like to be? All right. See that man. He needs your name. Uh, I will tell you, it's important to have organizations like this so that our college is able to demonstrate that we're here for people. I got a call today from a mother whose son is in high school who has come out and is gay in one of our local communities. And she said, I am so glad. This felt made me feel great. I am so glad to know I'm, my son is interested in coming to AUM because he knows that he has a family there. That this is a safe place for him. So guys, this is important. We may be a small group, but being able to say there's room at the table for you, if you're looking for a place, we've got one here for you. Whether, whether it's that you're one of those liberal Democrats that people talk about all the time, <laughs> or whether you're one of those LGBT people, you know. Uh, and now, of course, I have to talk, Ambrosia will be talking with you about manners. And so I want to talk to you about a type of manners in the South that we know what we're talking about. In the South, you could talk about straight people, and then you could talk about gay. You know, you know how that's done? You drop your voice. You know, I understand Devin is a lovely fella. Everybody loves him, but he's not sick. <laughs> and that's how you, you drop your voice there and, and you trail it off at the end. Oh. So no one ever says, you know, Devin's a lovely boy, but he's a heterosexual. No one ever does that. Um, but anyway, so we'll be talking about manners tonight. We'll be talking about our Chief Justice um, uh, of the Alabama Supreme Court. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Roy Moore, our Chief Justice? Okay. Okay. Some of you. <laughs> Uh, how many of you are familiar with his controversy from 2003? Now, depending on how you hear it said, one side of the room will tell you he proudly and bravely moved a 10-ton granite statue of the Ten Commandments into the foyer of the Supreme Court building in Alabama. The other side of the room will say he did it at 2 o'clock in the freaking morning <laughs> because he knew that he was going to get himself into trouble with the courts. Uh, so we have a history. If, if Missouri is called, what's the motto of Missouri? What do we call Missourians? What is Missouri? The show me state. And what is Alabama? The make me state. We will always do the right thing so long as the federal courts come in and make us do the right thing. And that's sad. This has got to stop. Um, some of you know my story. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail because I've gotten to spot where I need to move on. But the fact of the matter is, um, I married my husband in May of 2011. And barely two months later, my husband was killed in a car accident as he's going to work. Now, if you know how things were before marriage equality came to Alabama, you will understand that that in my case meant that I was refused access to him in the emergency room. Um, and in the eyes of Alabama law, even though I had a marriage certificate that was legal in Massachusetts, we were legal strangers in the eyes of the law. This is something that I hope no other person ever has to go through. But earlier, our Supreme Court said that you can't discriminate against people on the basis of their gender. And so you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of their orientation or their, or their gender identity either. And I'm pleased to say that in most situations, that went over without a blip. 
People just said, you know what? It's time to move on. Uh, people want to get married, well. Uh, there were other folks that had a different mind and defied federal court orders in order to be of that mind. One of the folks that stood up and challenged what was happening in Alabama was my good friend Ambrosia Starling. Ambrosia is an entertainer from Dothan, Alabama, has been in, in the entertainment industry for a number of years and actually came out of semi-retirement because she said this is something that we have to bring attention to. So without further ado, I want to introduce my, my dear friend Ambrosia Stark. <laughs> Don't ever let anybody say that I didn't turn you off. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, you know, I'd like to thank the, the GSA and the College Democrats for inviting me tonight, um, and especially my good friend Dr. Paul Hart. It's really hard for me to hear this story. I know it's a lot harder for him to live it. Um, the, the first thing I'd like to touch on today um, is, you know, good old-fashioned manners. Um, you know, it, and it's one of those things, you know, in the South, we are supposedly known, you know, we hear Southern hospitality all over the place. Um, but we don't see it being practiced very often. Um, I often tell people that, you know, when I was a young child and I was, you know, doing this, as we often do when we're, 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 before we go to school, you know, we learn our please and our thank you and our yes ma'am and our no ma'am and yes or no sir, no thank you. Um, I was at that age and I was having problems remembering so badly. I got busted three times in one meal. Um, and the third time I got busted, I said, I just banged my little fist on the table and I said, I'm just sick of these manners. What do I need my manners for? It's just words. It doesn't mean anything. And my grandmother set her cup down. She took her glasses off and she looked straight at me and she said, let me explain something to you, young man. Manners are how you show respect for yourself and how you show respect for other people. We, um, excuse me, somebody get a tissue, please. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, maybe squall too much, Paul. But, you know, manners is how you show respect for yourself as well as respect for someone else. Um, and really and truly, you know, and, and her, her philosophy was that, um, but, you know, she looked at me and she said, let me explain something to you. Manners are how you show respect for yourself and respect for other people in the world. And when you go through life, you should be, if you want people to treat you with respect, you have to behave with respect. It doesn't matter if you don't like somebody, you nod and you smile and you walk on. You don't have to say hey, you don't have to speak, but the basics of common courtesy are how we respect each other in a civilized society. And if you want to look back in history at any time, in any place, you can, you'll find out that every time that there was war, bloodshed, and mayhem, it was because one person or one group of people decided that it was okay to disrespect somebody else and treat them as less than everybody else. That, and you, that we see it over, repeated over and over and over and over and over again. The nine times out of ten, if you look within your history, it is because for any conflict, the source of any conflict, somebody decided it was okay to treat someone else as substandard. Whether it was one country looking at another, whether it was one group of people looking at another, somebody decided it was okay to lose their manners and disrespect people that they probably didn't even know. Um, you know, that, that to me, that has always stuck home with me. That's how I try and carry myself as I go forward in life. I'm not always perfect at it, but I always, you know, I know that I'm human. Um, you know, and I accept that you're human and we're all human and we're going to make mistakes. And part of manners, you know, is, is, is getting along. Um, and that's, that's, that, that, that's one of the fundamental things that, you know, we, we expect for, to, for our children to learn to pick up by osmosis because we're here in the South. Um, the thing is, is that we've forgotten to teach them the, the meanings behind those words. Um, you know, when it, and when it comes to, to respecting each other, you know, I can honestly, respecting people, I can honestly say that um, our Chief Justice has got some of the foulest manners I have ever seen in my life. Um, most especially for, in the manners and mannerisms and respect that he shows for the due process of law and with the Supreme Court of our United States of America. Um, 
this is not the first time that he has decided that it's okay, I don't have to respect them, I don't have to respect what they stand for. Excuse me. Because the Supreme Court of the United States stands for a lot more than just those justices on the bench. The Supreme Court of the United States was designed as an integral part of our Constitution so that there will always be a level of protection for each and every citizen against any unconstitutional laws passed by any legislative body, whether they are state or federal. Um, when, we, a lot, when someone like Roy Moore comes along, which is, is still shocking to me that out of 240 years of our country's history, no other justice on any level has ever tried to stand up and say, oh, just ignore the Supreme Court, they don't live here. Um, you know, and, and, and for him to do it, you know, twice, it didn't work the first time, so he thought he'd try again. Um, but I, I want you to understand exactly what that means. You know, that's what it means for people outside of it. If, if we allow any one state government to upset that balance and, and, and rupture that protection, we are all in jeopardy across the entire United States of America. Um, you know, for those of us who live inside the state of Alabama, what this means is that if the man who leads our legal system can be as biased as he chooses and can use his own personal beliefs to do as he chooses, then any judge, any police officer, any law enforcement officer can turn right around and do the same. So, you know, that affects you if you're going to, you know, at some point in time in your life, let me have a shot of hands. How many people have been, had a ticket and had to go to court? Okay, keep your hands in the air for me. Um, how many people have ever had to uh, answer a, a, a court summons for, you know, for um, di divorce court? Family court? Anybody ever been to family court even as a child? Um, okay. All of these, all of these issues, okay. Are, are depend for, for in order for them to be properly decided, in order for the sort of justice to truly protect the innocent, justice must be blind. And that means unbiased, without prejudice, in any shape, form, or fashion, in order for a fair outcome to come from the legal system. That's a fundamental belief, not only in our legal system, but in, for our society. And that is exactly what Roy Moore is attempting to destroy. He's attempting to open the door, because if he can get his foot in the door, he can get everybody, anybody else that wants to do it to come and ride along behind him and join him. We simply cannot allow that. We cannot allow that as Alabamians. We cannot allow, we certainly cannot stand for it as United States citizens. Um, the importance of that is just, it's, it's you know, um, James Madison, when he was introducing the Bill of Rights, um, you know, the very first, you know, we, we see where, the, where it got a bridge to, you know, Congress shall appoint no state religion. Well, the introduction of that line was, no, the civil rights of none shall be, a, shall be abridged on the account of religious beliefs, nor shall religious privilege be infringed. That right there, in the 1700s, well, I can say James Madison, that would have been right at the beginning of, uh, of the 19th century, in the early 1800s, without, without any useful need whatsoever for an iPad, an iPhone, an iThing, no electronic devices whatsoever. They had forged the beginnings of a society whereby we would all be treated equally and fairly, where people could live, where every single citizen of the country could finally live without any type of oppression hanging over their heads. They started the book, as far as I'm concerned, I consider the Constitution to be a book on how government can respect each and every citizen. It's our job, it's the job of our generation to finish that book, to finish that story. Um, you know, and see to it that we finally get to a place where there is at least one spot, one place in one country in this world where everybody gets a fair shake, everybody gets a fair shot in court, in your job place. You have a fair chance to have a house. You have a fair chance to have a decent life. Um, you know, that's, that's a big, huge part of the American dream is to be able to live freely without oppression, without anyone sneaking in your back door, without anyone busting in your back door in the middle of the night and tearing through your house. You know, when we try, when anyone tries to upset that balance, that very delicate balance that is, that is established, there's a reason that there are three divisions of our government. There's a reason that it was all set up that way. Um, you know, the president, if the president doesn't think it's the right thing to do, he can stop it. Um, 
if you know he doesn't he decides not to stop it and it infringes upon the rights or the privileges of, of a citizen and they happen to have the ability and the power to do so to fight that legal battle all the way to the Supreme Court like this young man right here then when they get there they can find to the Supreme Court if they, it has to go all the way far it has to go all the way then they are the final judgment and the final say they're the ones who will say no I don't care if you had 105 elected representatives that voted on this. It's not right. It's not proper. That's not how we treat people. That's discrimination. We don't do that here in America. We don't allow that here in America. We saw that with the Defense of Marriage Act. You know, the Broy Moore is all about the, the sanctity of marriage, you know, the Alabama sanctity of marriage laws, Alabama sanctity of marriage laws. Well, when the Federal Defense of Marriage Act was found to be unconstitutional, that should have been a clue. Um, you know, as we've gone through this process and everything, um, the Montgomery Advertiser has an excellent article on the chronological timeline of Roy Moore. And I think you should really, each and every one, take a look at that um, and spread it around any time somebody asks the question. Do you have that? Would you like me to bring it up? Can you? Yeah, you, you can I'll bring it up. I'll, I'll bring it up. It just take just a um, you know, it, it, it becomes, when you look at the timeline of events, it becomes very, very, very obvious. You know, if you're going to instruct some, if you're going to instruct or, excuse me, as Roy says, provide guidance. Um, by the way, I found out in um, the pretrial hearing on August the 8th, a judicial order is not to be used for instructions or for guidance. So whether you say I'm not providing instructions, I'm just providing guidance either way you've done what you said you were doing, weren't supposed to be doing, and what you knew better about. Um, but, you know, once the Supreme Court has rendered a decision, for anyone to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, good morning. Hello. <laughs> anyway, you know, <laughs> well, when, she, when she speaks, the heavens sing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like I said, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, he intends to aim at, 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 the, at, at my community, at my LGBT community. But I want for each and every person in this room to understand that the, he's not aiming this weapon at my community. He is sharpening the sword to be able to use it on anyone, at any time, anywhere, in any place that he chooses. And that's something that we just, as, as basic as Americans and certainly as Alabama citizens, you know, we just simply cannot allow. Um, and and I, I, I'm grateful to the people that reached out to me um, last July when um, there was a, a, a question as to whether or not it was going to be ratified by, um, here we are. Here we are. Let's go ahead. Go ahead and roll that up for me just a little bit, please. I don't know if you guys can see this, so I'm going to go over ahead and read this to you. All right, that's good. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, March 2015, the Alabama Supreme, Supreme Court orders uh, state probate judges to stop issuing marriage licenses to gay couples. Okay, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what kind of articles they are, but if they don't have pictures, I'm not interested in them. <laughs> um, uh, June 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that gays and lesbians have a fundamental right to marry. Um, in June 2015, uh, Judge Renee issues an order citing the U.S. Supreme Court decision and, by, and saying that she is permanently barring Alabama from enforcing state laws that ban same-sex marriage. Okay. A ruling has been made by the Supreme Court. There has been a reminder issued by a lower federal court to a state court. There is no question here as to what has gone on. And yet, six months later, acting without the other justices, Moore sends an administrative order telling probate judges that the Supreme, state Supreme Court's March order to refuse marriage licenses to gay couples remains in full force and effect because it has not been lifted by the state court. Um, you know, and, and, and it's one of those things where you know, it, it doesn't matter whether or not it's been lifted by the state court, okay? When the federal court rules, you follow. Period. End of discussion, okay? So if you were going to give anyone um, instructions or guidance, or as he liked to say, the, the, uh, obviously, advice, you advise them to do what is the right thing. Um, as as, as um, a very dear friend of mine used to say, you advise them to do what is the right thing and not the white thing. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to, you know, and this, and well, I, I, I'm sorry, let me clarify for a minute, you know. Um, I've always said that for each race, the color is what we identify with the negative parts of our race. 
So let me go on ahead and tell you that although you are looking at what you may consider to be a white drag queen, I am a Caucasian American. It took me a long time to learn how to cook, and I've taken plenty of classes on rhythm. Um, I've overcome what I consider to be my personal birth defects to get any issues out of the way. Um, but you know, and here we see, you know, um, you know, like I said, you know, by issuing the, let's see, where we go? There we are. Um, the, the Chief Justice stopped short of directly ordering just judges to refuse the licenses, writing that he is not, quote, at liberty to provide any guidance to Alabama probate judges on the effect of the U.S. Supreme Court on the existing order. But then he turns around and he does exactly that. Um, so what you see is a lot of very careful, what he thinks to be intelligent maneuvering, all within one document. The only problem with this is, is that, you know, and understand, if he had not punched that seal on the bottom of that administrative board and made it an issue from a public office, if this was something he wanted to say in church, we know that he wrote letters to the governor, if he wanted to write letters to USA Today, if he wanted to write letters to the Supreme Court or stand up and say anything he wanted to or shout it on, he could have shouted it outside of the Supreme Court on the Supreme Court steps. There would have been nothing, nothing, nothing anybody could have done about it. But when you take, a, take it upon yourself to use your public office to discriminate against any portion of the population, you are not serving the public interest. Um, you're not doing what you, what, you, what, you, what you said that you were going to do. You know, everyone takes that oath of office. Um, you know, and of course we also know that you know, uh, that's one of the things that I had quoted. Uh, matter of fact, let me borrow my phone here for just a second. I'm going to interrupt this real quick, watch. Because there's been a lot of talk about, you know, when um, Judge Moore uh, responded in his press conference, you know, he was blaming, um, I, I, at first I didn't understand why he would call me out specifically. I, was, I thought at first, well, that's just another bully trying to use an intimidation and terror technique. You know, and he has no earthly idea of the courage and the strength that it takes to run around in these clothes in southeast Alabama for 23 years. So he obviously underestimated his opponent. Um, it was not until we got, until August the 8th. This, um, was, this was from a man who walks around in robes all the time. Right. The only difference was you did it in heels going up those steps. Well, you know, uh, of course, on August the 8th, the court of the judiciary hears his request to dismiss the charges. And, of course, they deny it. Um, and it was on August the 8th when I was listening in, in the overflow courtroom and I was listening to this. Hold on a second, it's going to take me just a second to find this. Um, I was listening to them go on, and, and, and I, you know, of course, Matt Staver, I, I'm used to hearing his type of rhetoric, and that didn't surprise me in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't shocked by that at all. Um, I'm getting so old, it's not even funny. You, you carry on, I'll bring up something else while we're Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was really shocked to hear the opening arguments mirroring the statements and accusations that one drag queen and a young homosexual man with a year of pre-law had come up with. Um, give me just one second. I'm going to go ahead and pull those up real quick. Oh, there it is. We may hope. Um, you know, and, and this is what I want, I want this is a, a crucial part of what I want to explain to you guys. Is, let, me, let me read this to you. Um, we had to, and, and I'll explain the process. We realized that, you know, petitions weren't going to get it. The only thing that the, that the Judicial Court of the Inquiry is going to do with petitions is put them in the garbage. Uh, they have a process, and it's called a judicial, uh, you have to make a, a, register, a judicial ethics complaint. Um, we called to find out, you know, do you have to have a lawyer to do that? Um, and they said, no, you know, any, any citizen can, can do it. But the form was so difficult that, you know, it wasn't something that you, you can't email. You know, they meant to make the process a little bit difficult. You couldn't email. Um, you could photocopy the individual forms, but you had to have a separate set of forms. You had to have separate supporting documentation for each and every signature that you turned in. We were a small group of seven people trying to get this thing together. And so we sat down and we looked at all the, uh, we looked at the petition from HRC, and we looked at the, um, we looked at the, the complaint that the Southern Poverty Law Center had put in, and Southern Poverty Law Centers was just trying to, it was, it was to, to, to a lay person, to a normal person like me who doesn't have a college education, it looked like somebody was throwing a plate of spaghetti against the wall to see what would stick. <laughs> and so, um, 
you know, we, 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 we looked at that and we were like, no, 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 we, we can't do this. For one thing, we would not have been able to financially afford to have 60 pages of supporting documentation for every single signature. Um, so we took a look at it again, and what we found was Judicial Canon 2A in the Code of Ethics. Um, a judge should avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in all his activities. Um, now, that's Judicial Canon 2. Judicial Canon 2A is undermining public confidence in the judiciary and the due process of law. And when we all know the Supreme Court to be the final step in the due process of law, this is, you know, even, even to a drag queen who's been drinking every Friday and Saturday night for 23 years, this was pretty obvious. Um, that's the Judge Grenades order that we were talking about earlier. Um, Roy Moore violated the canons of judicial ethics by issuing this order and undermining public confidence in the integrity of the judiciary and has effectively attempted to reinstate laws that have been ruled to be unconstitutional concerning same-sex marriage. The following actions taken by Roy Moore specifically violate Canon 2A, undermining public confidence in the integrity of the judiciary. Roy did wrongfully instruct by use of an administrative order of the Supreme Court of Alabama to probate judges to violate not only due process clause and the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States of America Constitution as upheld in the United States Supreme Court ruling on Oberfeld versus Hodges, number 576, U.S. 2015, as well as the orders issued and further confirmed by United States District Judge Callie Grenade on July 1st, 2015, Exhibit B, which officially enjoined probate judges of Alabama from enforcing Alabama's laws that prohibit or fail to recognize same-sex marriage. This, issue, this violation was issued and signed by his own hand on January the 6th, 2016. It is unethical for any judge to deny fundamental rights or freedoms to any citizen when those rights have been affirmed by a higher court, as Warren Moore has done in this order and with his actions. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of times in my life when I have felt powerless, when I have felt like society was never going to work my way, when I felt that I was going to live my life underneath the steamroller when that affirmation came down to the Supreme Court of the United States for the first time in my adult life since I was probably 13 years old, I could stand up and I could say the Pledge of Allegiance. And when I got to with liberty and justice for all, I felt like that meant me too. Because for the vast majority of my life, I would stand with my hand over my heart and be silent because you weren't talking about me. You weren't talking about treating me correctly. You were talking about everybody else getting treated correctly. And maybe one day I'd be treated like a human being. <laughs> that is why I tell everybody, you know, this is our chance and our time and our opportunity. It's, it's your generation, the generation of college students that's attending this school right here and right now. You have been given a woeful responsibility to complete the journey that the Founding Fathers started 240 years ago. To create and finalize and secure a place and a country in this world where no one lives under oppression for any reason, way, shape, form, or fashion. That responsibility is yours. By the time that that journey is completed, I probably won't be here any longer. I hope I am. I hope that I'm sitting in a position like my grandmother was sitting in um, when President Obama was standing there being sworn in for office. My grandmother and I never discussed my sexuality. We never discussed what I did for a living. It was just one of those things, it's good Southern manners. You don't talk about an uncomfortable subject, darling, unless you got a way to advise somebody or give them a little help on it. So we just never talked about it. We were standing there watching the inauguration of President Obama, and I looked over. She'd been in the nursing home for about three weeks by this time. Not very long at all. And um, we're, so we're sitting in her little assisted living room, and we're watching it, and I look over, and there are tears running down her face. And I said, Grandma, are you all right? And she said, no, no. She said, yes, baby, I'm fine. I'm fine. She said, I just, she said, I remember as a child. I understand my grandmother was born in 1914. She said, I remember going downtown and wondering and seeing, you know, people, colored people with their, their children. 
She said, I'm wondering, you know, what did that, you know, how, how do you tell a child, what do you do? There are children here. Um, you know, how, how, what do you do? Well, these children have to go to the bathroom. You know, how, how on earth, you know, could, you know, I could go anywhere I wanted to, but they couldn't. They were just as human as I was. It, it, it struck her. So she looks at me and she says, I never thought that I would live long enough to see black people treated fairly enough in this community for a black man to be president of the United States. And then she reached over and she patted my hand and she said, baby, one day it's going to be okay for you too. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're getting those, those steps and those final lines, but I want to remind everybody, you know, what we're doing here is we're catching, once again, we're catching Alabama up with the rest of the nation. Um, you know, it's, it's simply another block by obstacle in the road for us. Um, but, you know, we, we will complete that journey, whether they want us to or not, whether I am lucky enough to live to see it or not. It's your responsibility to complete that journey for everyone, for the people that you don't even know are going to be born tomorrow, for your children that you con might be contemplating having or thinking about naked later on tonight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's, it's your responsibility to stand up and secure that. Um, and part of that responsibility, you know, lies in, in the fact that, you know, everybody keeps saying, well, how did he even get elected again? And I'm going ahead and tell you, Roy Moore's supporters did not elect him. The people who stayed home on voting day did. Let me say that again. Roy Moore's supporters did not elect Roy Moore. The people who stayed home on voting day elected Roy Moore. Those are the people that we have to stop. We have to talk to our parents. We have to talk to our friends. We have to talk to our cousins. It is a privilege that the Founding Fathers fought and died for. People talk about that. Oh, the Founding Fathers would just turn over in their graves if they saw how, how uh, everybody's being, how the gay community's being respected and treated like human beings. They didn't mean, y'all. No, what the Founding Fathers would be rolling over in their graves about is the fact that people don't vote. People don't participate. People have gotten so comfortable that if you're you to the point where, oh, well, I'm not oppressed, so I really don't care. I can, you know, it's not going to matter to me. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to my job, A to B, 9 to 5. It's never going to affect me. I don't even have to participate. It just takes care of itself because we're just that good. But it doesn't, nothing takes care of itself unless it's well tended. Not a garden, not a farm, not a cat, not a cow. Nothing takes care of itself unless it's well tended. So please, as you go forward and you leave this room, and you go on throughout the rest of your life, tend to your country, tend to your citizenship, tend to your freedoms, tend to each other. Thank you.